I'm going to make a brief introduction to today's event and to NECPRI. First of all, my name is Francisco. I'm from NECPRI. That's a nonprofit organization which works in articulation with the political studies department of Nova FCA Saga. And the purpose of our action lies in the study, debates, and understanding of political science and international relations. Along our 20 years of existence, we have hosted many events such as conferences, congresses, debates, meetings with ambassadors, and several simulations. So first of all, I'd like to thank you all for your pre presence in today's Congress, Beyond the West, Politics of the Global South. Uh, this Congress aims to promote knowledge and debate about the political landscapes of the often neglected areas of the Global South. So in the past three days, we talked about uh, Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East, and today it's time uh, to talk about Asia. Today's conference was organized in cooperation with uh, our partners from the Sun Orient or Orient Foundation, who is here represented by our moderator, Dr. Carlos Gaspar, which is an advisor for the board of directors at Fundação do Orient and a researcher in the Portuguese Institute of International Relations, among many other things. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's conference, and the floor is yours, Dr. Carlos Gaspar. Many thanks. Congratulations for the organization of this uh, Congress by NECPRI. The Orient Foundation is honored to be a partner of NECPRI in this uh, endeavor, which uh, comes under the title Beyond uh, the West. Uh, I was asked to say a few words about the Orient Foundation. The Orient Foundation is one of the major Portuguese uh, foundations and one of the very few European foundations concentrating on relations between Europe and Asia, or rather Portugal, Europe and Asia, since uh, its establishment in 1988. The Orient Foundation has created a museum, the Museu do Orient, the Orient Museum, in 2008. Again, one of the very few European museums specializing in uh, Asia. And our art collection is a mix of classical and popular art. And it also includes uh, many art objects from the Asian Christian heritage from India, China, Japan, or Indonesia. We also uh, maintain permanent delegations, cultural centers, if you will, in Macau, China, in Goa, India, and in Dili, uh, East Timor, and we will be very happy uh, to host you there if uh, your research, your work leads you to any of these uh, cities in uh, happier times uh, when we will be able to travel uh, uh, again. We have a fantastic panel uh, to deal with uh, Asian politics. Uh, uh, Professor Steinringen, Professor Jorn Dosch and Professor TV Paul. I'm uh, going to introduce them as they uh, uh, as they uh, make their presentations. And I will start with Professor Steinregen. He is a political science. He lectures sociology and social policy at Oxford University and is a visiting professor at King's College in uh, 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 London. Uh, his last book we publish is The Perfect Dictatorship, a rather wonderful title, and it's about China in the 21st uh, uh, century. Uh, uh, his next book uh, about to come out is uh, How Democracies Live, and it will be published by the Chicago University Press, and we'll address today the topic of uh, authoritarian tra trajectories in Asia. Professor Ringen, please. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, the term authoritarian is sanitized. It looks and sounds not too bad, but it is not a good term for understanding the reality of today's strongly repressive regimes. We are dealing with dictatorships. Some are brutally primitive military dictatorships we see that now in Myanmar with a very hard hand, and some are sophisticated totalitarian dictatorships, such as in China. 
And I have been fighting a bit of a battle over terminology since I started to engage in debates about China. And I have in that debate met a reluctance to clear language, a preference for authoritarian, and a hesitancy with speaking about China as a dictatorship. We are, however, dealing with regimes that are morally repugnant and very hard in methods. And language matters, and we should certainly, as academics, be as straight and clear as we can in language. Now, on the Western fringe of Asia, there is the family-run dictatorship of Saudi Arabia. This regime has its strength in the economic power of oil. It is ruthless internally, breaching no opposition. That was made clear in the murder last year of the journalist Khashoggi, a murder that was, of course, a signal that no one is safe and no one is out of reach. The issue of women being allowed to drive is enlightening. It's okay, you can now drive, but if you make a political point of it, you are not safe. It's a regime that is ruthless externally. The viciousness of the war that is being fought in Yemen is really beyond moral comprehension. The weakness of this regime is that power based on oil is running out. On the Western fringe also is Russia, today an oligarchic dictatorship and a very, very dangerous actor on the world stage. In 1989 and the following years, the Russian empire collapsed. This had been built up over three generations from Peter the Great to becoming the biggest empire ever gone and overnight it collapsed. Kazakhstan alone, once only one of many Soviet provinces, is today the world's ninth biggest country in territory. That collapse of empire was a gigantic humiliation. And Russia today is a wounded giant. The present regime is engaged in restoring respect and position in the world and in a long process of empire rebuilding. The buildup against Ukraine, which is unfolding as we speak, makes perfect sense. Russia is not a powerful force in conventional understanding. It is economically weak and it is internally fragile, but therefore all the more dangerous. And the regime is compensating by making itself feared. When they had the ex-spy Skripal murdered in Britain, they wanted that action to be seen. The regime is animated by anti-democratic and anti-European ideologies. The leaders are not simple thugs. They are carefully ideologically motivated thugs. 
On the eastern fringe, of course, is the People's Republic of China. Now, this is a regime of sophisticated totalitarianism, and it is a great power, economically, militarily, and with its own form of social cohesion behind it. In Russia, the population matters for nothing. In China, the regime has a good part of the population with it, a position it has obtained with the deliberate use of the always utilitarian instrument of nationalism. Now, for most of the Chinese population, the visible dictatorship is soft. I say visible because under the surface is a gigantic, gigantic apparatus of control. I have called this regime a controlocracy. My contribution to the political science language, controlocracy, a regime dedicated to absolute control. When necessary, this regime is as hard as it needs to be. In Xinjiang, there is now a complete police state, complete with concentration and internment camps in a culture that is being extinguished. In Hong Kong, freedom of expression and rule of law has been crushed. And it's really nasty now in Hong Kong. People are required not only to be quiet, and obedient, but to be actively patriotic. Censorship is total, including in the display of art in museums and galleries, so as to shut out non-Chinese, non-patriotic and non-suitable art. Externally, China is building up influence by economic investments. This is the Belt and Road Initiative, which creates dependency on the part of other countries by taking control of its own territory, expropriating the East China Sea against international law, now defending that expropriation with military means and threatening Taiwan now very deliberately also with military means. And it's building up influence by offering other dictatorships protection on the non-intervention principle. We see that in Myanmar, the military dictatorship there would not be as confident as it is without Chinese backing nor would the oligarchs in Russia be without tacit Chinese backing. So how to respond democratically? Nowhere in Asia between these Eastern and Western fringes is there any democratic mobilization. There is Australia and New Zealand, but between Russia, Saudi Arabia and China, there is, democratically speaking, a void. There is internal opposition, as always in dictatorships, but in very difficult conditions. In mainland China, the apparatus of control is all-embracing. There is opposition in the streets in Myanmar, but not backed up by any political organization. And in Hong Kong, the only rational position for liberty-minded people to take is independence and democracy. But that is a position it is absolutely impossible to pursue and to voice in today's Hong Kong. What then about the democratic West? Well, the good news is that America is back in leadership internationally 
and also in making itself an example of democratic reform. It is a very considerable movement. The not so good news is that it is difficult in the democratic West to speak with one voice and to act collectively. It's also difficult, but this may be improving, to be assertive on the part of democracy. Vis-a-vis -vis the Russia, there is NATO, which is now being mobilized on the Ukraine issue. But vis-a-vis -vis China, there is no instrument of collective action. And China is an expert in divide and rule strategies as we see in its policies vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. So this is a really big challenge. My friend, the German journalist Kai Strittmatter has said that the, the West needs to find its voice on China. It does that. It's difficult. It's a big challenge. And um, I will stop with that challenge. And for now, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Regan. Uh, I'm sure we'll get back to uh, uh, China and Russia. Uh, they make everything possible, not for us to forget them at any given moment. Our second speaker is Professor Jorn Dosch, who is a political scientist, uh, a chair of international politics and development cooperation at the University of uh, Rostock. And he has published extensively over the last few years on, inter on the international politics of Asia Pacific. He will speak to us on regional integration in Asia. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here, at least virtually. <laughs> I wish it could be in Portugal, but uh, well, uh, it's better to meet virtually than not to meet at all, I believe. Let me share my screen. So I've prepared a short PowerPoint presentation to visualize few ideas that I would like to present. Um, just a second, please. Oh, where is it now? Yes. yes. Okay. Regional integration in Asia is a big topic you can imagine. So I can only really speak about some of the most important regional organizations in Asia and some of the most crucial trends in regional integration. As you can already see here by looking at these pictures, Asia is of course a very diverse region. That is common sense. But it's important to appreciate the fact because given the ongoing process of regional integration, it is quite an achievement, I would say, that most states in Asia, despite the political, economic and cultural diversity, are engaged in efforts to bring the continent closer together to integrate in economic and political terms. And here I'm going to show you um, just uh, some of the best known and most important organizations. That doesn't mean that they are necessarily all equally successful and effective, but the first serious attempt at forming a regional organization dates back to the year 1967, when the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, was formed in Bangkok, Thailand. So ASEAN today comprises 10 of the 11 Southeast Asian states. That is uh, the blue circle here. Uh, 10 out of the 11, which means that East Timor is not a member of ASEAN yet, has applied for ASEAN membership, but the 
there are, I would say, some concerns both on the part of the existing ASEAN member states, but also I think concerns on the part of East Timor really to join uh, the organization and no real progress has been made. When you look at literature on regional integration and regionalism in Asia, publications, books, articles on ASEAN, often begin with the sentence, ASEAN is the second most successful regional organization in the world, second only to the European Union. There's a huge gap between the European Union and ASEAN in terms of integration, in terms of institutionalization, in terms of the organizational arrangements and so on, but it is a rather successful organization, despite the fact that uh, for a political scientist, this is a very exciting region because you basically have all types of political systems united in Southeast Asia. Uh, from the fairly consolidated democracy of Indonesia with its flaws, but it's a democracy after all uh, to the, well, re-emerging military dictatorship, unfortunately, in Myanmar, the Marxist-Leninist systems in Vietnam and Laos, and lots of political regimes that are somewhere between a democracy and an authoritarian regime and are either classed as semi-democracies or semi-authoritarian systems. Um, the South Asian um, equivalent to the Southeast Asian ASEAN is SARC, the South Asian Association for Regional Organization, which was founded in 1985. It comprises all states of South Asia and Afghanistan as well. Afghanistan, you know, geographic regions are socially constructed at the end of the day. Uh, there have been uh, for many decades discussions in academia as to whether Myanmar, for example, uh, should uh, be a part of Southeast Asia or rather belongs to South Asia. And if Afghanistan is a Central Asian country or South Asian country. At, at the end of the day, all these debates are really academic and it depends on your point of view and the way you construct a region. There are also uh, several organizations based on ASEAN, which extend into the wider Asia Pacific area. Uh, ASEAN also has very close links with uh, China, with Japan, with South Korea, uh, and has formed uh, additional groups, uh, ASEAN plus three, for example, the East Asian Summit. There's also a security related forum called the ASEAN Regional Forum, comprising many uh, 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 powers in the world, not just from Asia, including the European Commission, but also the United States, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. We then have the Eurasian Economic Union, which in its current form, it has some predecessors, emerged in 2015, uh, centered around Russia uh, with Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Armenia, and Belarus as members. Um, has been presented in the media occasionally as a rival or adversary maybe to the European Union. Uh, I don't think that uh, the Eurasian Economic Union has really reached the status of uh, being able to challenge the European Union as uh, an effective regional organization. But of course, it shows Russia's interest in playing more of a regional role in um, trying to reunite the former Soviet republics uh, and to reestablish itself. Uh, as a more powerful nation in Asia. We then have uh, some smaller organizations uh, like the Greater Mekong Subregion, which was basically established by the um, Asian Development Bank in 1992 uh, to bring former 
um, adversaries of and rivals of the Cold War together, uh, basically comprising all the states, uh, all the Mekong River states. Right, so, so just as a quick overview, of course, not to forget the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the most recent addition uh, to the set of uh, regional organizations or regional cooperation agreements uh, in Asia. Uh, and uh, you've heard lots uh, about the RCEP in the media. Uh, it uh, really uh, last year in, in November resulted in uh, many journalists uh, really presenting the RECP as a new type of a regional arrangement, which excludes the United States from the region. Also, it, it excludes uh, Europe from the region and uh, was in a way presented as the first serious attempt at regional integration exclusively based on Asian interests and very much driven by China's interest as well. This is only partly true because the RCEP was initiated by ASEAN, not by China, but China in a way united the different partners involved in the initiative and finally made it happen. So it was of course guided by the strong interest of China to have this regional organization. On the next slide, you have all the member states. So I'm not going through this, through this in, in detail. You can see it here. You have also the logos of the organization. So the RCEP doesn't really have a logo yet. So I put some other picture here. So when you look uh, what these organizations represent on paper, you will soon find that um, their a description on paper and what they claim to be does not necessarily fit with reality. Uh, so ASEAN, for example, claims to be a common market and production base. The thing is that ASEAN defines a common market in a different way than the European Union, for example. So it's not comparable. So ASEAN is not a fully integrated market, but uh, the regional integration of Southeast Asia is based on um, about 360 different agreements covering everything from investments to customs procedures to standards to intra-regional trade uh, to the mobility of professionals uh, to air travel and so on. The thing is that not all of these agreements are fully implemented. But on paper, this looks really like a very comprehensive organization, which is deeply integrated. Again, in reality, ASEAN is not as integrated economically as it seems, but Southeast Asia has certainly come a very long way in increasing cooperation among the 10 states involved. And an argument that holds true for the European Union, which is of course repeated time and again, that regional integration in Europe has resulted in stability and order also applies to ASEAN. Southeast Asia is one of the most stable and peaceful regions when you look at relations between and among states. It does not necessarily apply to events and developments within those states, as we currently see in Myanmar and um, the human tragic, which is unfolding there. Um, the SARC is a free trade area, uh, which also only basically exists on paper because there is not much of an intra-regional trade. So the intra-regional trade volume measured uh, in percentage of uh, the, the countries the member states overall trade is just about 4%. The Asian, uh, the um, uh, Europe, uh, uh, Asian, uh, the economic union is a customs union on paper, uh, but again, not uh, fully uh, Eurasian economic union, I want to say is a, or struggling with, is a customs union, which is not fully implemented, which has a lot to do with the fact that the organization, uh, although it has its uh, secretariat in Kazakhstan, is of course uh, completely dominated by Russia. 
Uh, and all these states are, of course, uh, focused on Russia in economic terms. There are satellites of Russia. So there is trade with Russia, but there is no real significant trade volume among the other member states of uh, the EA EU. Uh, then the RECP is a free trade area, not only on paper, but also in reality, but it's not a comprehensive free trade area. So um, there are different types of free trade areas, of course. When the European Union enters into free trade agreements in the world, uh, these are truly comprehensive and very detailed agreements, which not just cover trade and investments, but also uh, labor standards, environmental standards, and this is why sometimes the EU's partners are reluctant to sign these agreements because they are going too far from their point of view. Because um, organizations like ASEAN, for example, which about 15 years ago also entered in negotiations with the EU about a free trade area, um, prefer these more simple agreements that just focus on trade and investment not including, let's say, intellectual property rights or, or any deeper uh, and far-reaching standards that they would have to commit to. And this is also one of the reasons why negotiations for an EU ASEAN free trade area ultimately stalled uh, and have never uh, resumed. So then finally, the GMS as one of the examples of several sub-regional uh, cooperation schemes in the region. So it's called a natural economic area bound together by the Mekong River. It's a big development project, bringing the states that are listed here together under the umbrella of the Asian Development Bank to build infrastructure, roads, bridges, uh, railway lines. And this has been fairly successful. So the region uh, has uh, grown closer together and the infrastructure is now much improved due to the efforts of the Asian Development Bank and all these member states to uh, really develop this region together. Finally, uh, seven key observations related to regional integration in Asia. So first of all, coming back to my introductory statement, Regionalism in Asia happens against the backdrop of a very high degree of economic and political diversity. I already mentioned the diversity in terms of political systems, but of course, and I think I don't have to elaborate on that, also in economic terms, we have a substantial diversity. We have, of course, countries belonging to the richest nations on earth, like Japan or Singapore, and then we have some of the poorest uh, as well, Bangladesh, for example, Myanmar, Cambodia, uh, Tajikistan, uh, all member of uh, this region. And again, given this diversity, it's remarkable that regional integration still happens to some extent. What is typical for all these regional organizations for regional integration in Asia in general is that there is a strong reaction of supranational structures. Uh, so none of these organizations is like the EU or is even remotely like the EU because there has so far been no agreement nowhere in the region to transfer national sovereignty to a higher level, uh, which would be comparable to the uh, institutions of the European uh, Union in Brussels. So. Even in ASEAN, an organization that is already 50 years old, 53 years old to be precise, and which has come a long way, um, no attempt has ever been made really to create a supranational uh, institutional layer. And of course, this has to do with the diversity of the region. This has also to do with the history of the region uh, because national sovereignty was, of course, and independence was only gained uh, relatively uh, recent uh, after the Second World War, of course, well, it's now a long time ago already, but of course, in terms of the history of states, that's a re relatively short period of time. 
And so they are all still involved in the process of nation building. That's why they are reluctant to um, restrict uh, this national sovereignty that they just won a relatively short while ago. Um, that also means that there is a lack of central authority to enforce agreements. Um, in turn, that means that um, the agreements that exist, and we have a very long list of agreements in place, are ultimately not legally binding um, because they cannot be enforced. Uh, so that is a real problem because how do you implement regional integration? How do you make progress on regional integration if agreements are not enforceable? But there are soft institutional arrangements in place instead of legally binding agreements. This is also a way of, that's what we always do, uh, of course, in political science, when we compare the European Union to other regional organizations, uh, a clear feature of the European Union is that it is based on legally binding treaties and agreements, whereas all these organizations in uh, ASEAN are more based on soft arrangements. They are more based on convention, on morally binding commitments, uh, informal agreements. Um, for example, ASEAN has a very elaborated conflict resolution mechanism in place, which has never been used because the states of Southeast Asia prefer more informal ways to conflict resolution. Uh, I'm concluding now, I have uh, half a minute left. Uh, uh, so there is also a shifting focus from trans-Pacific to exclusive Asian organization and treaties. Uh, 20 or 30 years ago, it was almost unthinkable to talk about regional integration in, in Asia without considering the role of the United States. Now we have, for example, RECP, which does not involve the United States. Uh, so there is a growing awareness and a growing interest among Asian states to uh, have or follow exclusive Asian ways to regional integration. So in other words, the US and other powers are invited to participate, but they don't have to. Uh, it's not a requirement anymore in the mind and in the perception and in the strategies of several Asian governments. So I already um, elaborated a bit on the limited effects on international trade. Uh, so none of these regional organizations have really achieved a high level of economic integration, but in their external relations uh, have been able to um, pool their interests, increase their voice in international, international relations. And this applies particularly to ASEAN, which has established itself as a very important and influential actor on the international stage. And finally, there's the problem of hegemony in some of these arrangements. Of course, when you look at Southeast Asia, Asia you see that um, the, the international relations of the region are very much focused on India um, and in the case of the Eurasian Economic Union, we have uh, Russia. And again, an organization that uh, solved this problem of hegemony quite well is Southeast Asia because here we have Indonesia as the largest country by far, uh, but Indonesia has never tried to play a hegemonic role in ASEAN and this is one of the uh, success factors for the effectiveness of ASEAN and one of the reasons why the uh, why SARC and uh, the Eurasian Economic Union do not work that well because uh, Russia and India have not really abandoned their hegemonic role and their hegemonic interests vis-a-vis -vis the other member states. Thank you very much and sorry for uh, going two minutes over my allocated time. Thank you so much and uh, uh, excellent presentation stressing the strength the, the sheer strength of uh, regional dynamics in international politics now which sustains uh, organizations like uh, asian but also new agreements like the rcp cep 
And uh, now I turn to Professor T.V. Paul, who is a lecturer of international relations at McGill University. Uh, he served as our president at the, the International Studies Association very recently. Uh, uh, his uh, latest book is Restraining Great Powers, published by Yale University Press. And he is the lead editor of the forthcoming Oxford Handbook on Peaceful Change in International uh, Relations. He will talk to us about security threats in Asia. Professor T.P. Paul. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. And uh, this is probably my second uh, appearance on one of your panels. I don't know you recall, Professor Gasper, I visited Lisbon maybe uh, 15 years ago. I don't know exactly. Yes. Um, there's a slight change in my topic because um, it's a vast topic. So I thought I will uh, focus on China's rise and how that is shaping the security threats environment and how other countries are responding to that, because that's probably the most uh, interesting one at this point. That could change, obviously, depending on your uh, locus of interest. Um, as everybody knows, uh, after keeping a low profile for uh, more than three decades, uh, China under Xi Jinping has asserted itself, and asserting actually, now declaring that um, it's um, want to rise rather rapidly, and it is rising in terms of raw economic indicators and military indicators, and also in terms of its expansionist role in many areas of the world, especially in Asia Pacific and Africa uh, in particular. And so uh, Xi uh, has been talking about uh, globalization, um, at the Davos summit in uh, 2017, he talked about uh, welcoming countries aboard the express train of China's development. <clears throat> and um, so globalization has been a big facilitating factor, the deepened globalization for China's uh, re-emergence in the world scene under Xi to some extent. Um, and the aim is now to make China the predominant power of the 21st century. Now, there is a, a bit of a, a thinking in Chinese uh, strategic uh, uh, writings as well as uh, presentations today that uh, China is going to replace the United States probably more fastly, uh, more, uh, more faster than uh, um, it was anticipated. Uh, 2030 was the earlier, maybe even earlier because of the pandemic's uh, impact. And the Belt and Road Initiative is definitely the key of that, uh, um, that strategy. And um, Belt and Road Initiative, as everybody knows, uh, is sort of resurrecting the old uh, Silk Road and Maritime Silk Road to some extent, but much elaborate, a network of uh, communication as well as development and links, trade routes uh, all through Europe, uh, Asia Pacific to Europe and to other parts of the world. Now, I kind of um, wrote this paper, part of a Michigan University Press volume that, was, that came out a couple of years ago, but uh, some of the points are still very useful, I thought. My contention is that this Chinese uh, efforts to uh, increase or um, um, to uh, accelerate its uh, rise as hegemonic power is evoking a number of uh, responses in the region. And I think, uh, my preliminary argument is that China will not achieve hegemony that easily. In fact, uh, it's going to be very, very hard. And if it pushes too hard, it may result in uh, an unnecessary conflict. Um, partly because China has not won any war, it's engaging in a symmetric conflict. And the fact that uh, when the United States assumed hegemony, it was uh, after World War II, and there were no strong contenders except of course Soviet Union, but it was not a big player in Asia Pacific, at least the Pacific waters. And so China today faces a number of uh, uh, states and that have sufficient capability uh, uh, singularly or in unison with uh, their other partners at least to balance or to, if not contain completely 
uh, a, a dominant status that China would seek. And so, and I think the, the, the big difference also is that you, are, you have a number of states, even the smallest ones, are very sovereignty conscious, Westphalian states in many ways. They are not going to easily succumb to China, although debt trap diplomacy is working probably in the short term. But I think in the long run, uh, there will be resistance. And I think this is where China will have a, a bit of a tough time. And so let me talk about different countries, how they are responding to China's efforts at hegemony or Tianxia, as they uh, renamed it uh, in some of them call it, is a tributary model that, um, that the system at China had up to a point um, um, in the 14, 15, 16, 17 centuries. But even that Tianxia was a very limited order and fine to regions um, very close to China, Korea, uh, part, sometimes Vietnam, part of Japan, but not even that effectively. But a few other states in the, uh, some of them don't exist anymore. And the fact that this is also a time when four other major, uh, or three other major systems were in existence. The Mughals in India, the Arab, uh, powers, countries, uh, not countries, empires, and uh, the Europeans who are slowly penetrating the Asia Pacific uh, through the maritime front. And of course, Russia as uh, the other power. So it was never, the, if you look at the totality of the region, you cannot call it a, a Chinese centric world. Um, and, but at the same time, uh, it was quite powerful in its own way, and benevolence was uh, the, the main claim of its, um, uh, its existence. So there are a lot of books about, um, you probably know David Kang at the University of Southern California has written about this, resurrecting this uh, Tianxia model, and China may succeed, um, and what's a good thing about it, etc. Now, <clears throat> The problem again is uh, which countries will agree with it, especially the dominant countries. I don't see the main potential challengers that is Japan, India, ASEAN, if you want to call it uh, together. And of course the United States and Russia to some extent are unlikely to accept a Chinese led international order unless it's willing to share some of its uh, its uh, power and, and uh, resources. The United States, for instance, now of course, uh, in terms of raw economic indicators, the US is relatively declining or uh, China is rising. But to transform that into influence will be quite a bit difficult for China because the United States still has residual power in many areas and combined with the military power that the United States will not be easily going away from the region as Biden is already planning a counter to the BRI and strengthening actually increasing defense spending, uh, not decreasing. In fact, following some of Trump's policies that we thought he would abandon. And so um, in many areas that the Chinese are catching up, maybe in particular, but catching up is one thing and dominating the whole region is another thing. And South China Sea is uh, where uh, this uh, Chinese buildup is going on. And I would think that the South China Sea is, uh, as, soon, as long as China doesn't prohibit international travel or uh, maritime traffic, China can probably continue up to a point, but it hasn't received the recognition that it is looking for. It's still going to be quite hard. Now, the United States, of course, has its own domestic politics, as everybody knows, but it has better allies than China does. Uh, if you look at the Quad meeting, that the quadrilateral grouping recent meeting, first time the heads of states uh, were meeting uh, online, of course. Uh, this is a, a countries of um, uh, uh, United States, Japan, India, and Australia. 
they have formed this soft balancing coalition, I, I would call it no military alliance, but it is a precursor if necessary, if the threat uh, level increases, it may turn into a military alliance. But at this point it is not, but it has um, all the elements of soft balancing using institutional mechanisms, a kind of an entente to restrain this Chinese uh, rise and give assurance to the regional states that they won't be completely abandoned if China, China engages in highly aggressive moves. Now, the country that I'm more interested uh, in many ways is India, because I originally come from there, but I have a lot of interest uh, intellectually too. I think it's a quintessentially Westphalian state, and I cannot see India easily succumbing to China, and the border conflict, recent border conflict in the Ladakh region showed that it will stand up, even if it is pushed. It doesn't have enough military power to withstand an all-out offensive. But that's why the Quad is very important for India. If, uh, as in 62, if it notices a uh, potential for a defeat, very likely that the United States would intervene in, if not directly, indirectly. In fact, at the end of 62 war, the US, India were about to sign a military alliance, uh, as far as we know, it was abandoned. Uh, the new archival stuff is coming out as China withdrew from the, some of these uh, regions that it occupied. And so the Indian government today is uh, led by a Hindu nationalist movement, a Hindutva uh, a BJP under Narendra Modi, highly nationalist, again, almost all the ambitions of China. And in fact, following some of the same strategies of domestic uh, consolidation uh, and uh, ethnic uh, uh, kind of um, uh, strict policies with respect to creating a religious state in some sense, which may or may not succeed. But the point is that it's based on a nationalism. And if you look at other alternate models in India, Nehruvian as well as liberal ideas, all consider India as a rising power and potentially a very economic major power. Of course, this pandemic is hurting at this point. But the expectation is that it will rise out of that and will emerge as second to China in another two decades. And so it has domestic problems, as everybody knows, extraordinary uh, challenges it's facing internally. But the raw indicators give the capacity to at least to withstand in, in alliance with other states. And so India is playing the swing state uh, uh, strategy and kind of hedging at this point, but obviously it is not going to be easy for China to uh, dominate India the way previous empires uh, empires did. And so Japan is the other case. You notice that Japan has uh, a Japanese uh, prime minister is visiting Washington, <coughs> probably just arrived. And in fact, the main topic is how to resist China in without really uh, creating a big military uh, mobilization. But uh, anyone who knows that, China, Japan is a, again a quintessentially Westphalian state and very proud of its own achievements. It has certain demographic deficiencies at this point. But the point is that Japan can, if it wants, and every indication under Abe was that the constitution was going to be amended. Uh, if the threat level increases, Japan could change and become a normal military power. I won't go into Russia, which is actually probably the only country that China can court, but I see a great trouble there for an alignment unless the United States and all become very hostile to Russia and pushing them to form an alliance. Why? Because the Russians realize that they will be a second class or second uh, rate partner in this alliance. And my own personal contacts, some of the Russians call it, there's a great ambivalence on China's rise in Russia. Because they are threatened by the United States and the Western countries with sanctions and all, they think that they need to form this uh, kind of coalition. But it is kind of soft balancing coalition at this point. It is not militarily coordinated. It could potentially, by the way, and we can get into a bipolar sort of a situation. 
But I think that's very unlikely, partly because you have, um, uh, you have um, great economic interdependence among states and uh, the chances of a cold war system emerging uh, in the way it emerged as very limited because of the economic interactions. The Soviet Union had very little, or Soviet bloc had very little economic interactions with the Western alliance. Finally, ASEAN, we discussed a little bit, uh, uh, Professor Dosh just now. Um, ASEAN is perhaps the greatest uh, territory of area of contestation by China and the other powers. But if you look at ASEAN, ASEAN is hedging too. But ASEAN countries, other than Cambodia and Laos maybe, are very reluctant to become part of a Chinese tributary system. And because they, they are new in the independent states, and therefore there will be contestation by China and the United States is within ASEAN. But as a region, it is not likely to follow, fall into the Chinese orbit that easily. Now, China has a number of strengths. I don't want to undercut the Chinese technological infrastructure power. China is helping a lot in terms of QIP development in some of these countries with, of course, attendant debt. And the BRI could potentially be a new East India Company model to some extent, uh, basically, as the European countries dominated Asia with that. But the BRI, you're getting now mixed reports that some projects are not progressing at all. The, even the Pakistanis are quite unhappy with it, uh, uh, CPAC, uh, that part of it. And uh, because many of these countries in the pandemic uh, uh, reasons too are finding it very hard to pay back China, uh, the, the money and so debt trap will be a big issue. So they will end up giving uh, real estate and other assets to China. But what does that do in terms of this kind of a new imperialism, a colonialism? I don't think it will be easy. Even, you know, I visited Sri Lanka and I found there was a lot of resentment that they got the hump and dot uh, that naval uh, port. And there were, in fact, there was a protest going on in front of it when I was passing by that way uh, a couple of years ago. The, by the Sri Lankan laborers for being fired. Um, and so I think obviously China can continue building some of this because these countries don't have many other sources. China's other um, press point is its technology and it's uh, rapidly developing economic muscle strength. And, uh, but there's a legitimacy deficit in China's efforts partly because the South China Sea or the territorial conflict China is engaged in. Uh, most of them, China doesn't have legitimacy. China is uh, violating some of the rules of international law and conventions. And so, of course, China can say that uh, Taiwan and the India-China border all are not legitimate, but the point is use of force to achieve the goals will undercut China's um, normative claim for a peaceful rise, for instance. Uh, most states at this point are not using force to acquire territory. So it's uh, resurrecting these old ideas uh, in this era of uh, globalized world order, the era of uh, uh, high level of interactions and nationalism um, is going to be very difficult. So I have only a minute or so left. Let me conclude by saying that um, um, China is definitely going to try. Uh, it has attempted institutional means, as, um, uh, BRICS, BRICS Development Bank, Asian Infrastructure Bank, et cetera. And it is also very actively using uh, economic globalization and trade and other structures to achieve its goal, building a Navy, a symmetrical power through different uh, means. Um, and uh, the point is that um, uh, this uh, abandoning peaceful rights strategy, uh, China is using some of that strategy, by the way. I don't want to say it's completely abandoned. Um, definitely, it will rise as probably a G2 uh, important power and over a period of time, very important. But these other points of resistance I mentioned, especially India, 
have great potential unless they completely messes it up to continue to emerge. So a kind of quasi multipolar order is likely to happen with the two dominant states, of course. But I don't see it as a bipolar world with two alliances in the short run, at least. And the fact that uh, nobody wants to see another hegemonic order in Asia Pacific, especially the smaller states. So there will be resistance, but at the same time, this pandemic, uh, we don't know how long it will continue and what impact that will have on economies and political structures of different countries. And so my conclusions are that, uh, but hegemony that Xi Jinping is seeking is going to be very, very difficult to obtain. Thank you. Inshallah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Thierry Paul. Uh, Professor Stadringen is going to leave us, but if I may, I would like him, I would ask him to address the question on the Myanmar situation. There is a question for you saying, uh, what do you think will happen in the near future in Myanmar? Do you think that something could have been done to prevent situation that we are witnessing uh, uh, today? Professor Ring, please. And well, final remarks, if you will. Well, thank you. <clears throat> I really have no idea. I don't think we should be um, quick to predict. I mean, there is a very strong mobilization of resistance in the streets. And as we have seen in many situations recently, this can be effective. Um, the military regime has absolutely no legitimacy morally or otherwise, and has no other support than the Chinese one. So I think it's an open situation. I, it, it's, it's really very sad to see this kind of old fashioned, brutal, violent military dictatorship. Um, uh, but then uh, if it collapses, what is the alternative? I mean, this is so, so difficult. Um, so I, I think I will refrain from any prediction. Uh, and I would just add the experience to a sad list of dictatorships that get away with very bad behavior these days. With that, I need to apologize to the organizers and to the participants that I, for reasons that I've explained, I have to leave. I thank you for the invitation. I compliment the organizers with an absolutely excellent uh, beginning of this discussion. And I wish you all the best in the continuation of this discussion. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, on with there is. I have a couple of questions. You want me to try to respond? Yes, I mean, you are already addressed the Russia. The yeah, Russia. I think I addressed, but so I, I can go, I, just a brief comment on it. Yes. Uh, the the, the also, danger of- And also the India in this equation, because yes. uh, there yes. is a balancing act between Russia, India, and China. Yes, very true. Uh, actually, the Russian uh, foreign minister was just in India. Yeah. trying to balance. Um, so the, 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 the question is very important, partly because the Western policy, especially US just imposed a huge uh, uh, set of sanctions on, um, on Russia. And I think that is pushing Russia into Chinese orbit with respect to economic uh, development and uh, economic interactions. If, Russia has nowhere to go, it will go to China. But um, the military conflicts that China is involved with India, with Taiwan, with Japan, in South China Sea, none of these uh, is of, um, in Russia's interest to get in, involved. So what um, uh, Central Asia is a very different game, but I think that that's uh, Ukraine is potentially. And China, by the way, has little interest to see Russia conquering Ukraine or taking over and upsetting. Ukraine issue has also 
China has not been very supportive as far as I know. Of course, outwardly they may say something. So this shows that security cooperation based on common interests are, uh, is going to be difficult. But if the West continues this um, uh, sanctions and uh, alienates Russia or isolates it, put it in a very corner, then Putin may have to form some kind of a alignment uh, sorts. But again, I am reluctant to see that uh, unlikely it will uh, develop into a hard balancing military alliance, definitely in the short and medium terms. But once again, international politics is a very difficult game to predict completely. But with respect to India, the, the problem is India's uh, used to be 70% of its military hardware came from Russia. Now that has declined to something like 50%. I think still it is a substantive part of the old uh, system of uh, transfer continuing. Therefore, India has uh, a great stake, but India also is diversifying. US, France, recently big French Rafael aircraft, France occurred. So, but what Russia is trying to do is uh, trying to sell weapons to Pakistan. There are limitations to that, how much Pakistan can absorb. So Russia needs India, it, not only as a customer, but also to make sure uh, that China does not overwhelm the whole region. So on this issue of the India-China border contestation, Russia was trying to mediate, but not very successfully, uh, partly because um, it's an old conflict, as you, you know, that um, suddenly it's uh, being propped up by PLA entering the territory and uh, India responding. So I think that Russia has also a big interest to make sure India doesn't fall into this uh, US alignment. So the Quad, Russia is probably okay as long as it remains a soft balancing coalition. But if it becomes a hard balancing coalition, then Russia is like, like it to abandon India to a great extent. The other player that's potentially going to be important is Iran, where you have, uh, if, if a new agreement uh, or agreement is renewed, the nuclear agreement, Iran then be allowed to sell its um, oil and gas to countries like India. And also they may uh, resurrect the Chabahar, the fort and the other uh, infrastructure associated with it. So Russia has uh, quite a bit of stake in India, and India has to, and likely that, um, and, and India also has stakes in China, by the way. It's not going to abandon this relationship with China. So India's best strategy is to be loved by everybody, <laughs> sought by everybody, a swing power, uh, and it will try its best to remain as a swing power, as a bridge, bridging power, as long as it can. But the point is, um, there are uh, serious issues, security cooperation with Quad, for instance, if it becomes a naval alliance, and that will upset Russia and China, obviously. And so India is going to play this uh, soft balancing as long as it can. But if China pushes the border very intensely as it recently did, and returns to that border conflict again and again, India may not have, and also enters the Indian Ocean as a very powerful Navy. India may not have a choice but to go to the United States. Russia won't be there to protect India. So I think this is an emerging situation, alignment strategies. I say the ball is in Xi Jinping's court. How many countries will turn against it? What kind of alignments will emerge? And territorial conflict is definitely a big challenge in this whole milieu. Thank you. I was uh, 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 talking to Matt Pottinger the other day, and I was asking him uh, why uh, the, the United States will not press for a formal alliance uh, with India. And he responded, and he has a point, that India is an ally of the United States in all but name. And it's much more convenient for everybody that it remains so. You used the word entente, uh, yeah, entente. a while ago. Yes. And uh, the, 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 the triple entente back in 1914 was mostly a yeah. soft power coalition until the, the bell rang. It's true. It, it turned into an alliance later. 
Yeah. No. Uh, could I perhaps add a bit on Myanmar, if I may? Please do. Yes. Um, the situation in Myanmar is, is very complex. I mean, what we usually reflect upon now are the past few years and uh, what appeared to be a democratic period, but which was never stable and the military had never really seized power. So the, there's a long history of military rule in Myanmar, which started with the military coup in 1962. So for the past 60, uh, 60 years, basically, Myanmar has been ruled by, by the armed forces. And the legitimacy, legitimacy that the armed forces created for themselves was always the unstable situation in Myanmar because Myanmar has never been a peaceful country. So the authority of the central state has always been, as long as Myanmar exists as an independent state, been challenged by uh, regional ethnic groups. Um, the, the regional groups run their own state administrations parallel to the central government. Uh, there are the so-called um, ethnic armed forces. So th they have their own military forces uh, engaged in um, constant fight with the uh, armed forces of Myanmar. So this is how the, uh, the military created legitimacy for itself by arguing that only the military and only a, a military government was in a position to guarantee relative peace and stability in Myanmar. And uh, there had been, uh, there has a, has, has, there is a history of violent, uh, of, of uh, suppressing uh, mass protests. It happened several times before uh, that the military used force uh, to suppress demonstrations. Um, and it seems that they think they can get away with it again, like they did in the past. But we also have to see again that uh, although uh, Myanmar had a democratically elected government, uh, so the elections of 2015 were celebrated internationally as a big success and proof for the fact that we do not just see the regression from democracy to uh, authoritarianism or the backsliding, as it is also called in the political science literature, but that there's also the other way and the other direction of development that we still see democracy democracies emerging from authoritarian rule. So there was a lot of hope, but in the background, the military always pulled the strings. Uh, it was a civilian government tolerated by the military. So, but I find the question very interesting uh, that was uh, posted here. Do you think that something could have been done to prevent the situation that we are assisting today? So, um, I've been following the situation in Myanmar very closely. I've been there on a very regular basis. I have evaluated uh, many of the EU's and other uh, donors uh, programs and projects in Myanmar. So uh, when Myanmar opened itself and, and started this, this process of political liberalization around 2011, 2012, foreign donors flocked into the country. So once uh, it was, acceptable again to cooperate with Myanmar once the sanctions were lifted. Uh, Myanmar immediately received hundreds of millions of uh, euros and dollars in development assistance. So what I found, I mean, it's not easy to say, I told you so, right? But what I clearly saw when I evaluated these major multi-million projects and programs of the European Union and other donors, that they were very optimistic about the future prospects for Myanmar. No one really questioned the stability of the regime. There were no worst case scenario. Everyone uh, of the Western donors worked on the assumption that the process of democracy would continue and that the democracy would further consolidate, that it only took some kind of Western assistance to help Myanmar achieve this objective of democratic consolidation. Unfortunately, it didn't happen because 
no one really saw or wanted to see the writing on the wall. Uh, but um, uh, the situation that we have now is tragic. It's very sad. It's a human catastrophe, but it's not really surprising. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm rather pessimistic about the future of Myanmar. So I don't see a quick return to, um, to democracy and liberalization or an acceptance of the fact by the armed forces that they cannot fully establish control over a longer period of time. Uh, but the problem is, as it was mentioned before, the West doesn't speak with one voice. So there is no, I, I can't see that there is real pressure being put on Myanmar because there are so many different interests involved here. And um, despite all the rhetoric that we hear from Western government, I don't see any real initiative to change the situation there. I agree with you that we went too far back in 2015 in uh, assuming that uh, a democratic transition was in place. And this was not the case. It, this mm. was a, a tolerated civilian government and, uh, 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 and we went for, but at the time, both the United States and the European Union and Japan, uh, all, all of them were working in the same direction. Exactly. And now India has taken a very cautious position mm. Japan, too, has taken a very cautious position. Only the United States is coming to the fore uh, in a very strong way. I think because of China and Russia, uh, rather than because of, uh, of Myanmar uh, at, at, at this moment. We have an, another issue coming up. Uh, for the, the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization for Professor Dorsch, uh, uh, the question is how can we make sense of the existence of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in light of its members' rivalries and the very limited cooperation taking place? Yeah, it's a good, good question here. Um, well, I uh, didn't talk about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization due to time constraints, but it would be another example for the way that China is trying to build uh, multilateral organizations uh, and engage in multilateralism to uh, create more legitimacy for its own role in the region. I absolutely agree with Professor Paul that uh, I don't see Chinese hegemony really emerging and firmly establishing itself uh, because um, there are uh, not many states really in the region that would embrace uh, dominant, preeminent, even hegemonic role of China. Uh, but in order to uh, promote its interests in the region, uh, there is certainly a multilateral element involved there. And the Shanghai Cooperation, like basically all the other organizations I talked about, first and foremost serves political purposes. So although when you look at, and when I try to do this in a very limited way, uh, when you look at the uh, programs of the organizations, of their declarations, of their uh, statements that emerge after the, uh, the heads of state and government have met, they're always, um, emphasize um, economic cooperation, economic integration. But in reality, it's more about building political relationships. Uh, and also, and, and this has worked quite well, uh, building trust in the region. Communication, I think, and most conflicts in the past was, uh, in many cases, just think of the First World War, just think of the Korean War, have happened because there was a lack of co communication. Uh, so although um, organizations like the Shanghai um, Cooperation Organization doesn't seem to have a strong impact on international relations, and although, of course, they comprise uh, members that um, um, compete with each other in many ways, uh, they are still useful, I believe, because they provide 
a framework for interaction, a framework to exchange views, a framework to speak with each other, uh, a framework for diplomacy, uh, which, which I consider a good thing in international relations. The problem is to some extent there's a proliferation of regional fora, of regional dialogues, and um, if they do not produce any results, then um, their existence is questioned. So um, I'm not sure what the future of uh, holds for the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, but I, I see a strong Chinese interest in maintaining this, uh, this organization and using it as uh, uh, one, one way of, 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 of course, promoting certain ideas and interests. And also in a way, because it's related also to the question uh, above uh, that one on the South China Sea, uh, what we clearly see is a carrot and stick approach on the part of China. I, I strongly believe that the South China Sea is uh, the most um, decisive and the potentially the most dangerous security hotspot in the region. It can easily escalate. Uh, but China uses instruments like the RECP, for example, the ASEAN-China Free Trade Agreement, which exists in addition to the, to the RECP and is much older, uses uh, its political leverage uh, in the region to um, create um, some, well, to some extent, dependencies on the part of the Southeast Asian nations on China, so to make a um, hegemonic role of China in the South China Sea more acceptable, uh, but uh, the other claimant states in the South China Sea uh, do, no, do not uh, show any signs of, of accepting the such a role of China. And this is why I think everyone just tries to maintain the status quo. Everyone tries not to rock the boat, uh, pardon the pun, uh, but uh, it is it is a very dangerous situation there. That's for sure. Well, I may add uh, the the Chinese uh, hope is that the United States would decline to such a point that it would withdraw from the Pacific, especially South China Sea, and at that point it can somehow dominate the system of the regional order more concretely. Now, this is uh, a possibility the U.S. would reduce its commitment, but not uh, to the extent of allowing China to take over the entire South China Sea, the nine dash line, as it has been talking about. And uh, Professor Dosh is uh, correct to say that you notice that not a single state in Southeast Asia, even the weakest ones, Brunei, I haven't agreed, agreed to, uh, hasn't agreed to the Chinese conception of uh, uh, the regional, uh, uh, the nine dash line. And that, that uh, they are pushing as much as they can, Philippines and uh, Vietnam often clash the Chinese. And this hasn't increased Chinese legitimacy of the claim at all, but China is doing everything it can, physically creating this uh, artificial islets, et cetera, to hope, hoping that uh, one day its position will be legitimized uh, through whatever means. But the international law, the, the tribunal in The Hague had already declared the Chinese efforts are illegal. So I don't see um, this uh, transforming uh, transformation of uh, de facto occupation becoming de jure anytime soon. But at the same time, Chinese Navy is strengthening. It will have the capacity to pressure some of these countries, but uh, potentially a, a zone of uh, major conflict exists if China is not careful and the US also is not careful. Uh, but the point is that um, the old strategy of conquering and then declaring uh, our territory and the rest of the world forgetting about is no longer that easy for any rising power to achieve as happened in the past. Therefore, the Chinese efforts uh, partially succeeding, but definitely not going to be uh, hegemony of, of the imperial era. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Paul. Thank you, Professor Dorsch. This was a very interesting debate and quite an education. I'm sure that uh, uh, all our audience uh, 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 agrees. I uh, would like to thank you for your participation and give the floor back to the organization. Thank you very much. 
Once more, I'd like to thank our speakers, our moderator, and our audience. Thank you all for being present here today and in the previous three days. Uh, if you want to know more about Snack Pre and our future events, you can always follow us on our social media. And the recording of today's conference, as well as the previous ones, uh, will be pu published on our YouTube. So if you want to see it later in the future, you can do it. Uh, thank you all.